I appreciate Jim Stoffel to send to our song selections tonight. You know, as he handed me a list of songs that he wanted to sing and on Wednesday night and I saw that he had America the Beautiful on, I thought to myself, what does this have to do with what I'm going to talk about tonight? But it does. It does have something to do with not what some folks would call a traditional song that we would use in our worship. But even so, isn't the message of the song the beauty of giving God the praise for how he has blessed us as a country? And I appreciate Joe and his, and his prayer. As a military brat, one who traveled all over, he is correct in his statement. When you see the troops coming home and the respect that they show to our flag and all of those things. And so tonight as we think about the song, Glory, Glory, Hallelujah. You may also have seen this song titled, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. Or maybe you've heard of it and it's not called this much anymore. But the original name of the song was the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And as I think about what that means, written during the time of the Civil War, I know congregations of the Lord's Church that refuse to sing this song because to them it is the same equivalent as the Confederate battle flag. This song was written as a marching song for those who served on the northern side during the Civil War. And I could say a whole lot more about the background and the history of this song, but it wouldn't get to the point that I want us to look at tonight, and that is to see some of the biblical meanings that are found within the words of the three verses that we sang. I think that as I, as I was studying for this, I think I read about eight or nine different people who have written about this song. And the background information was just in depth. And it makes you stop and it makes you appreciate what the thoughts were of the writer of that song. And brother, no matter how you feel about it being a song that came from the Civil War, I still believe tonight that it is a hymn which serves for us as a reminder that the Son of Man will come in the glory of His Father with all the holy angels, just as Matthew proclaims in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 27. It reminds us of so many things that come from the pages of God's Word. The writer of the song took an existing melody and she just wrote the words, Julia Ward Howe. And so when you and I will separate that worldly side of the song and look at the spiritual side, I think we will see the following things. In stanza number one, I believe the writer of the hymn is exposing for us in picturing the Lord's coming. Has the Lord's coming been that which is pictured throughout Scripture? Perhaps you will remember Acts chapter 1 and verse 11. Just as Jesus has ascended into heaven, the angels that were there looked at those that were gazing up into the heavens. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? That same Jesus who was taken into heaven will in a like fashion come again. The Bible throughout the New Testament especially speaks of the second coming of the Lord. We remember the Old Testament was that which dealt with Jesus as it was yesterday, as He was in the past, in the creation, 
and the longing and the looking to His coming to the earth. The New Testament pictures for us through the book of Revelation that Jesus dwelt and is dwelling among us today. And then that passage in Acts, it speaks to the fact of what takes place in the book of Revelation, and that is Jesus is coming again. And so as I look at that first verse, when Jesus comes, what is going to be the primary purpose? The verse of our song says that when He comes, that He will judge the world. And that is symbolized as you read and as you sang the words, the trampling in the winepress. And that is a figure of speech which is used in the Old Testament, referenced back to the book of Isaiah in chapter 61. But even in the New Testament, if you turn to the book of Revelation and you look in chapter 14, begin with me in verse 17 and notice John as he's recording those revealed words, he says this, he says, Then the, another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over the fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine." And threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. When Jesus comes again, his purpose will be to judge mankind. His purpose is going to be to gather, to put us in that winepress figuratively. That we might see the wrath of God. And then in verse 20 it says, And the winepress was trampled outside the city. And the blood came out of the winepress up to the horses' bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Now, brethren, I don't know about you, but how many of you have ever seen a horse? Oh, surely you're Yes, I'm joking. We've all seen a horse. How tall is a horse? If the horse has its head at a normal height, how far from the ground to the bridle is that? Four feet? Five feet, maybe? Can you imagine a stream of blood that is five feet deep and 1,600 furlongs long? You see, what, what we see pictured in Revelation, the wrath of God is going to be even more than our minds can imagine. The writer of our song is trying to call the attention to us that the wrath of God is not to be taken lightly. And in the last part of that first verse where he speaks of that fateful lightning, of the terrible swift sword. Brother, that is very simply a word picture of God's word. Because it is by God's word that you and I will be judged. You remember the words of Jesus in John chapter 12 and verse 48. He says, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. And Jesus doesn't leave it for us to think about what it is that's going to be the judge. He goes on and he says, The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. We talked this morning about the blood of Christ and how the things that the blood or the conditions and different things about the blood of our Lord and Savior when we fail to hear what he has to say, those are the things that are going to hold us accountable in our life. Or perhaps we could go to the writing of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 in verse 17. There beginning in verse 10, he lists the armor of the Christian. And then in verse 17 he says, And take the helmet of salvation 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I hope you remember what Hebrews chapter 4 in verse 13 says. Where the Hebrew writer says the word of God is what? Quick. Powerful. And it has the ability to discern. It can discern the joints and the marrow. God's word is that which is going to judge us. And that faithful bolt of light is the word of God in our song. But as I move into the second verse tonight, what I see is our songwriter telling us and giving us a picture of the Lord's judgment. And some of somebody's going to say, now Brother Ray, you just talked about the Lord's judgment. Well, in some way I did, didn't I? But the second verse deals with that in a much greater depth because it reveals to us and it recalls our memories back to the Old Testament. Do any of you remember the Israelites? And you remember they crossed over the Jordan River into the land of Canaan, right? And they came to that great walled city known as Jericho. What did the Lord tell the people to do? He said, six days you'll march around the city one time. On the seventh day you'll march around. The priests will blow the what? Trumpet. The trumpets. And then you will have a great shout and the walls will come down. <clears throat> Brethren, when we see what he is saying, the songwriter, what she is trying to tell us in this verse, just as God used the trumpet of the Old Testament to sound out, to call to attention something, he does the same thing in the New Testament, only the trumpet which sounds to us today is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is that which we hear and, which what, with, with what, and that which we obey. The gospel must be the trumpet sound that we sound forth to a world that is unprepared to meet our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. That is what I see our writer saying. But then as you go on in the second verse, it says that the gospel is sifting out the hearts of men before the judgment seat. And that is the time which leads us up to that day of final reckoning. Three passages come to my mind as I think about that, or two passages, I should say. The first one comes in Matthew chapter 3 and in verse 12. There it is recorded that his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly <laughs> clean the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Brethren, that's a picture of the judgment day. That's the same picture of the judgment day that we read of in Matthew chapter 25. When the Lord comes, He's going to part them to the left and to the right. He's going to divide them as goats and as sheep. He's going to purge that which was unworthy for His cause. Or maybe we can go to Matthew chapter 13. And begin reading in verse 36. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 36. The parable of the souls. Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the, the, tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is, not, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the field, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels, and they will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend 
and those who practice lawlessness. Brethren, did you catch what Jesus just said? The separation that he speaks of, the field with the tares, is referencing the church. Not everyone who claims to be a member of the body of Christ is going to be saved. The Bible clearly states they will gather out of His kingdom those who offend and practice lawlessness. And notice what happens to them. It says, And will cast them into the furnace of fire, and there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, <coughs> let him here. Jesus says specifically in this aspect of how the gospel is going to sift and separate for folks to hear. Pay attention. How many times in the book of Revelation do we see that term? He who hath ears, let him hear what the Spirit says. Jesus didn't have to say hear what the Spirit says because Jesus Himself had the authority. He says, hear me. <clears throat> Listen. Our song teaches us that the gospel, the sifting is going to come through what we know and how we make application to the words that have been so fitly spoken. Or under that verse, the third thing that I see comes from Romans chapter 10. And that is that our feet should be swift, should be jubilant to spread the message. Paul, as he writes in Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 14, notice what he says. And these are, in my opinion, rhetorical questions. He says, How then shall they call on Him whom they have not believed? Is it possible to call on someone that you have not believed in? No. In question two, He says, And how then shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? How can I believe something that I've never heard of? And how shall they hear without a teacher? And yes, I changed that word. I changed that word from preacher to teacher. And the reason I changed that word is, is because it's not just the preacher's responsibility to spread the gospel. All of us ought to be teachers. Did the Hebrew writer not mention that same thing? He said, did he not say there should be a time when you ought to be teachers and not have need of the first principles? I, I, I think that's over there. Maybe Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12, if my limited memory will serve me correctly. There's a time when we all must be teachers. We must all be a preacher, a proclaimer of God's word. But then as you go on and it says, And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not obeyed the God, all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see what? How can someone develop faith in God if they're not taught God's Word? And I believe the songwriter is trying to tell us about God's Word being the standard of judgment in verse 2. But then as we go to verse 3, and by the way, there are about seven, six or seven verses to this song. Some of them don't fit biblically, but the three that we're looking at tonight are the most prolific, by the way. 
But I believe that our writer reveals to us and paints the picture of the Lord's purpose. When I think there in the first part of the verse where the writer speaks of the lilies of the field, did Christ not also speak of the lilies of the field in the Sermon on the Mount? If you go back and you look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse 8, he asks the question, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they speak. Jesus asking this question about the lilies of the field. What is God's purpose? Is God's purpose to take care of His creation? That's the point I think Jesus is making. We tend to worry about the things that we have no control over. And Jesus points to the lilies of the field. And as He looks at the lilies of the field, He's talking about something that is lower in the chain than mankind. You see, because for us as mankind, Genesis reveals to us that we are the only living beings that it can be said are created in the image of God. God's going to take care of His creation. That's His purpose, is to take care of us. Or perhaps you may go back to the book of Luke in chapter 2. And there in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, as we see the record after Jesus or before Jesus is born, and it came to pass that in those days a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was while that they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room in the inn. The Lord's purpose was to make a way for our salvation. And that way of salvation came in the form of of the one who laid in swaddling clothes in a stable. Paul in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 records the words, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son. So when you think of the lilies of the field, that reveals the glory of God and how we can be changed. Mm -hmm. How we can be changed. But secondly, under the Lord's purpose, the whole aim of Jesus was to come and to reveal unto us the glory of God so that we can be like Him. When I go back and I read John chapter 1, we read that the Word became flesh, right? Verse 14, where it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. What does it mean that it says, We beheld His glory? John is saying, And we saw what the Son of Man looked like in a physical, fleshly form. And he goes on, and he says, it is the glory that is, it is the glory as of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. Brother, God's purpose was to send His Son so that we could be changed, transfigured, into that spiritual being that could dwell with Him in heaven for eternity. Mm -hmm. For we know 
that no mortal shall be able to live in immortality. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and in verse 18 further speaks of this transfiguration where it says, but we all with an unveiled face beholding as a mirror in the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. When I think of this transformation, this transfiguration that is taking place, perhaps we should compare it to the life cycle of a butterfly. <coughs> How does that life cycle begin? Doesn't it begin in a self-wound cocoon? And then out of that self-wound cocoon comes a caterpillar. And then that caterpillar transforms into what I think may be one of the most beautiful things in God's creation. And that is the butterfly. We are transformed as we learn and as we grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And ultimately we will be transformed into the spiritual being, into the body, just as Jesus was changed after his resurrection, before his ascension. So that we might live in eternity forever. You see, we are changed. We must be changed. But then the last part of that verse speaks to the fact that he died to make men holy. There's a challenge for us. How many of us would be willing to put our life on the line to save another soul. I'm thankful we have men such as Brother Ted. Who when he goes into Southeast Asia. He's willing to know. That he may not come home. He knows the conditions. In which he works. I'm thankful that we have missionaries. In Iran in Iraq, in the former Soviet Union, I'm thankful. Every day those folks are putting their life on the line. Would we be willing to do the same? You see, Jesus put his life on the line and he lost his life that he might save ours. No matter where we are in life, what are we willing to do to ensure that the message of liberty is going to be proclaimed. Perhaps you remember Jesus in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 25. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The one who's not willing to sacrifice will be lost in the end. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, a passage I know that we're familiar with, but God demonstrates His love towards us while we were sinners. Christ died for the ungodly. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11, this is a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. Mm -hmm. You see, our writer of our song, she's painted a wonderful picture of what God means to each of us. How the Lord is coming, how he's going to pass judgment in his purpose in our life. In the chorus, by the way, the chorus is repeated. 
And it also expresses the glory to God. It expresses the sentiment of how wonderful it is for us to be able to praise Him. And so tonight as we bring our lesson to a close, as our thoughts surround this battle that's going on between good and evil, and we consider the ultimate victory of God's people, When the second coming occurs, may we all sing joyfully and cheerfully, glory, glory, hallelujah. Tonight, you have a need to respond to the Lord's invitation. Maybe you have some knowledge of what you need to do. And you can begin walking the walk that we spoke of this morning, that walking in the light. You can begin that journey and you can continue to grow as so many of the rest of us have as we have gathered and as we have studied from God's Word. Knowing that no matter where we are, that we always have room to grow more. You can come tonight with a penitent heart, the willingness to confess the name of Jesus, be immersed with Him in the watery grave with baptism and have your sins washed away. Rising, walking in that new life. Or perhaps you've done that and you've forgotten that the Lord has a purpose in your life. And you haven't lived the way that you need to live and you need to come back home. Repenting of sin and confessing those sins. And let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. We're all here for one reason. And that is to help each other as we journey from the earthly land to the glory land. You know your need. We just ask that you come to the front. Make your need done, and you can do that while we stand. While we stand. <laughs>